The first harbinger, the sign of the breach, the nation's hedge of protection is removed and an enemy is allowed to strike the land, manifested on September 11, 2001. The second harbinger, the sign of the terrorists. The attack is accomplished by masters of terrorism, a brutal people who target innocent civilians to traumatize a nation, manifested September 11, 2001. The third harbinger, the sign of the bricks, the image of the falling buildings, the rubble, the rune heap, and the bricks that have fallen, manifested September 11, 2001. The fourth harbinger, the sign of the tower or the rebuilding. The nation embarks on a campaign to rebuild the runes and to rebuild itself, to become stronger and greater than before, even taking the form of a tower manifested in the days, the weeks, and the years following September 11, 2001. The fifth harbinger, the sign of the Gazit stone. A stone must be quarried out of mountain rock, brought back and laid on the ground of destruction in the place where the bricks had fallen and become a sign of the nation's rebuilding and its defiance, manifested July 4, 2004 at Ground Zero. The sixth harbinger, the sign of the sycamore. The attack on the land must result in the striking down of the sycamore. The sycamore is struck down and is noted by the people, a biblical sign of national judgment manifested September 11th, 2001 at the corner of Ground Zero. The seventh harbinger, the sign of the Erez tree. The fallen sycamore is removed and a tree of a different nature is placed in the exact spot where the sycamore had once stood. The tree must be a conifer tree a panacea tree, and made into a symbol of defiant hope, manifested November of 2003 at the corner of Ground Zero. The eighth harbinger, the sign of the utterance, the vow is proclaimed publicly on behalf of the nation by a national leader in the capital city, a vow linked to the attack and speaking of sycamores and cedars, bricks and quarried stones as symbols of the nation's defiance, manifested September 11, 2004. The ninth harbinger, the sign of the prophecy, the vow is proclaimed as prophecy publicly on behalf of the nation by a national leader in the capital city, a vow linked to the attack and becomes a matter of national record it sets the course of the nation, pronounces judgment on the land, and speaks of things yet to come which will all come to pass, manifested September 12, 2001. All of the nine harbingers manifested in the last days of Israel before its destruction have been manifested on American soil. The nine harbingers, the nine warnings, omens, manifestations, and foreshadows of national judgment. So what does the future hold? Isaiah 9.10 is a vow of national defiance. And it's amazing because you can look through the commentaries on this verse and they all agree, they all use the same word or describe it in the same way. This is an act of defiance.
the harbingers, the nine harbingers of judgment, are contained in that vow, either implicitly or explicitly. The people of Israel say this, the leaders say this, God, you're not gonna humble us. You may have caused us to, to have this attack. You may have allowed this attack, but we are not gonna be humbled. We are not gonna return to you. We are not going to repent. We're not gonna search our ways or change our ways. We are going to rebuild. We're gonna come back. We're gonna undo this attack. Had the nation repented, rebuilding wouldn't have been an issue, it would have been natural. But without repentance, to, to say this back, what, what Isaiah is saying is that they are shaking their fist at the hand of God who is trying to wake them up. America, like Israel, was founded also for God's purposes, established uh, to to glorify his name in the world. And God blessed America more than any nation. But America, like Israel, also turned away from his ways, has been turning, is turning rapidly, is in rapid departure from the ways of God. We've driven God out of our schools. We've driven God out of our government. We've driven God out of our culture. mock him, we uh, denigrate his people and his word, we've taken down the Ten Commandments, we have taken the Bible from our children and prayer. If we continue on that course, there is only judgment. As a nation, we must turn back to God. We must repent for driving him out of our culture, out of our land, out of our lives. Now we're going to see that this very same vow, this ancient vow of defiance, the exact words and everything it says, every detail is going to be manifested in the United States of America and is going to open the door of a revelation as to the future of America and America's response. Harbingers continue, the mystery advances. That's what happened with ancient Israel. They're warnings, they're foreshadows. And if the nation does not turn back to God, they must continue, the shaking must continue, the escalating judgment must continue. That's exactly what happened to Israel. The attack came, the, the attack was over, and they took the normalcy, or what looked like normalcy, to be the end of it, but it wasn't the end. It was a period that God gave them to choose him or to defy him and go to judgment. And so it was a grace period. And so that's where they, they utter the vow. The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have been struck down, but we will plant cedars in their place. So they vow, no, God, we're gonna continue. We're gonna go on our own course. So what happens right there is they are setting the stage for future judgment for escalating judgment. And the commentaries speak about this very thing. And it says this, one says, God's first acts of judgment did not result in the transformation or repentance. Uh, so since the first act of discipline did not bring about a humble confession of sins, a second punishment was necessary. And if you look at the actual prophecy of Isaiah 9:10, it goes to Isaiah 9:11 and on, and it's, it, that's exactly what it says. It says, because you are saying this, because you have done this, because you have not responded to God, you haven't turned back, there is gonna be now more calamity and more shaking. If a nation doesn't solve its spiritual issue with God, all other solutions are gonna fail. So now the mystery of the harbingers are now going to produce something else. And I call it the Isaiah 9:10 effect. And that is this, the attempt of a nation to defy the course of its judgment, apart from repentance, will instead set in motion a chain of events that will bring about the very calamity it seeks to avert. 
Israel says we're going to rebuild, we're going to strengthen our walls, we're going to fortify our national defenses, our national security, and we're going to come back stronger than ever. There would be nothing wrong with trying to rebuild or strengthen oneself or protect oneself. The problem is that there is no turning to God. The root problem is not being touched, so every other solution is going to backfire. So here the mysteries of the harbingers are going to continue and they're going to produce a second American calamity. The Isaiah 9 10 effect, there's going to be a second shaking. You have 9-11, it touched America militarily, and you're going to have a second shaking that's going to touch America in its economic power, its financial foundation. The mystery of ancient Israel is now going to replay in modern America. And so what happens is the campaign to strengthen America's security requires massive expenditures. The war on terror, multiplied billions of dollars are drained away from the economy. U.S. taxpayer having spent nearly one trillion dollars on the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq since 9-11. The Defense Department continues to spend 5.6 billion dollars a month in Afghanistan, nearly one million dollars per service member each the year. The war in the Middle East helps facilitate an explosion in oil prices. The price of crude oil is spiking, the price per barrel near, nearing 100 dollars, and that means we could see a big hike at the pump by tomorrow morning. Massive government expenditures on the war terrorists produce skyrocketing debt over the American economy. That's the fear that the world's largest economy, the U.S., has finally lost control of its debt. When the head of the central bank addressed the Senate today, this is what he had to say about the long-term threat posed by the government borrowing $1.3 trillion a year. It is widely understood that the federal government is on an unsustainable fiscal path. Yet as a nation, we have done little to address this critical threat to our economy. Doing nothing will not be an option indefinitely. The longer we wait to act, the greater the risks and the more wrenching the inevitable changes to the budget will be. And yet all these things, which will hurt America, it'll be another manifestation of this Isaiah 910 effect that's going to bring about the collapse of the American economy. And it happened just a few days after 9-11. It was six days after the attack. The government, the Federal Reserve, is worried that 9-11 is going to collapse the economy there because it's already weakened and so they're afraid of it hemorrhaging. So on that Monday after 9-11, the Federal Reserve takes its first action. It's actually in a sense, America's first action of we will rebuild. The Federal Reserve has cut interest rates once again. It was a move that many had expected to come sometime today. The central bank lowered the overnight benchmark half a percentage point to 3%, and this is the eighth rate cut this year. Now, again, the cuts were widely expected as the central bank has been seeking to keep funds flowing through the economy and also boost consumer confidence. It starts an extreme slashing of the nation's interest rates, and it goes on, it hits 1.75 in December, just a few months later. It forces the interest rate below inflation. The extreme rates open up an era of easy money. It causes unprecedented uh, borrowing and lending, credit bubbles, uh, housing bubbles. The stock market surges, the effect spreads around the globe. The credit explosion leads to an explosion of debt, and standard cautions that people would have are discarded. Banks discard caution. They get involved in risky practices, increasingly uh, making loans they would never make, investments they never would make. Personal debt, government debt, corporate debt, all mushrooms, and the, this is the Isaiah 910 effect. It creates an economic house of cards, and it all goes back to 9-11. It all goes back to the dusts of 9-11. And in September 2008, the effect comes to full force and the economy, the American economy crashes, the greatest economic disaster since the Great Depression. The American people are concerned about the situation in our financial markets. I've canceled my travel today to stay in Washington and consult with my economic advisors. And it goes back to this biblical principle and hear a commentary saying this. Divine anger, being a remedial force or corrective force, will not cease until its purposes are wrought out. If one expression is resisted, another must be found. Major financial institutions have teetered on the edge of collapse, and some have failed. 
As uncertainty has grown, many banks have restricted lending. Credit markets have frozen, and families and businesses have found it harder to borrow money. We are in the midst of a serious financial crisis. Everything there completely wiped out. And the NASDAQ, everything and more has been completely wiped out. The Dow traders are standing there watching in amazement, and I don't blame them. The credit market... 676 points down. It was the worst day on Wall Street since the crash of 1987. This collapse that comes on the American economy weakens the American economy and hastens the end of the era of America's reign over the economic global order. And when did this crash specifically take place? What caused it? There was a specific action that the American government took just before the crash that caused the crash. And this happened in New York. It happened in September 2008 when the leaders of the Federal Reserve came to Wall Street and they informed Wall Street, we are not going to touch Lehman Brothers. We're going to let this, this corporation fall. That decision, the fall of Lehman Brothers, would begin this entire economic implosion. When did that happen? It happened on September 12, 2008. And what is significant about that date? It's exactly, it's the day that the vow was made on Capitol Hill when America vowed we will rebuild. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. And so it was the seventh anniversary of that day, of that vow, and here it all that America sought to do without God comes crashing back. In the book of Ezekiel, it says this, the Lord sent a word, so I will break down the wall you have plastered with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so its foundation will be exposed. One of the signs of judgment is the laying bare of foundations, the exposing of a nation's foundations. What is a nation's foundation? It's that on which it rests or that in which it trusts. America has been the world's greatest economic, financial superpower of the past century. But what is the foundation of that superpower that could be laid bare in the time of judgment and that could be linked to 9-11? America's financial power has centered on the island of Manhattan and it began in the 17th century as a Dutch trading post. And soon, the Dutch traders saw that they needed protection, so they built a wall. And along the wall, they set up shops. And later on, the wall would come down, but the street would remain, it would be called Wall Street. In the late 18th century, the foundation was actually laid for America's financial rise. It began in March of 1792. There was a secret meeting in a Manhattan hotel, 24 leading merchants of Wall Street, they form or they agree to form a stock association. May 17th, they have a second meeting and they come together and they sign the agreement to found this stock association. And the document will be called the Buttonwood Agreement. And the association born of it was called the Buttonwood Association. What does Buttonwood mean? It's the name of a tree. It's the tree that was there on Wall Street that they used to gather under to do business. And under that tree, they signed the document. So it was called the Buttonwood Agreement. What is Buttonwood? Buttonwood is another way of saying the sycamore tree. So you could call the document that started America's rise of financial power, the Sycamore Agreement, and the association the Sycamore Association, which later became named the New York Stock Exchange. 
On September 11, 2001, the World Trade Center collapsed, and as it fell, as we've seen, it sent a beam, it sent wreckage into the air, and it struck down a nearby object. That object was a tree. It was the sycamore tree, which is the symbol of America's foundation, the foundation of American financial superpower. What would the uprooting of a sycamore tree be? If, if America's financial power is founded under a living tree, what does a dead tree, what does a dead sycamore mean? If a living sycamore means the beginning, what does an uprooted sycamore stand for? And they actually put that sycamore on display and it's a symbol of uprooting. And not only that, but on another anniversary of 9-11, a sculpture is unveiled. It's a memorial to 9-11. Of what? It's of the sycamore tree that was struck down, formed in bronze, formed of the root system. It's the uprooted sycamore tree. And they put it on display where? They don't put it at ground zero. They put it at another spot. They put it on Wall Street. God had allowed America's power to be planted and to take root and to branch over the world and to reach towering heights. So now, as America departs from God, the blessings begin to fade. And so here is a symbol that what was planted would be removed. If America does not turn back to God, it cannot maintain its blessings. And so another word from the prophet says this, God saying, what I have built, I will break down. And what I have planted, I will uproot. God gave a command to Israel called the Shemitah, or the seventh year or the Sabbath year command. Six years you will sow your field, and six years you'll prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath. So in the Shemitah, or the seventh year, the Sabbath year, all laboring on the land stopped, all sowing, all reaping, all harvesting, all the fruits were abandoned. On the last day, Elul 29, anyone who had a debt had to release it or anyone who lent something, it was gone. Loans, credit, the nation's financial accounts were wiped away. The Shemitah was meant to be a blessing, but if the nation turned away from God, the Shemitah turns from a blessing to a judgment, to a sign of judgment. In Israel's history, the people would be driven from the land and the land would rest. And God said, now the land is going to keep its Sabbaths or Shemitahs. And so Israel was in captivity or exile for 70 years. Why? It was based on how many Shemitahs they had not observed. So the Shemitah also holds the key to the timing of the judgment on a nation. The Shemitah causes production to cease labor to cease, buying and selling of produce to cease, and it wipes away the nation's financial accounts. So that can resemble an economic collapse. When did the economic collapse of America happen? This is the second shaking. It happened seven years after the first shaking. It happened seven years after 9-11. So if you didn't have 9-11, this would not have happened. That means even 9-11 is woven into the mystery, an ancient, ancient mystery of the Shemitah. When America was commemorating 9-11, the seventh anniversary, the second calamity was already beginning on Wall Street. And what happened? Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. Other companies went bankrupt. Debts and loans were wiped away. Financial accounts were wiped away. Shemitah, uh, the bankruptcies, Shemitah, bailouts, foreclosures, Shemitah, uh, nationalizations, crashes, 
swept over the world. It was a colossal Shemitah wiping out of financial accounts. What started in America last year has now spread to every part of the world. We're down 9% today. The Zetradax over in Frankfurt is down by 9%. The Paris market down by 9%. Austria, which was briefly suspended earlier on in the day, is down by nearly 11%. So when was the peak of the financial collapse? It happened at the end of September in 2008 was the greatest stock market crash in the history of Wall Street. And so when did this greatest crash take place? It took place on the 29th day of the month of Elul, on the exact biblical day specifically ordained to touch a nation's financial accounts. It took place on the exact biblical day that is a judgment to the nation that has driven God out of its life. Customers are freaked out, waiting to see how low the Dow will go. There. We are just seconds to go until the start of trading at the New York Stock Exchange, and stocks are set to kick off lower a whole. We're in the last days of this country surviving, and how in the world can we find the billions of dollars that we're borrowing from China and Japan? What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Two-year note yields went from 190 to 166 in the blink of an eye. I have never live looked at the Dow Jones Industrial Board and seen a 600-point loss. Who knows where this is going to end up? And it marked the end of a seven-year period, and the key number of the Shemitah is seven. And so how much of Wall Street was wiped out that day? Seven percent. How many points exactly were dropped? Seven, seven, seven. Can't look at it after you buy it. It's so hard. And that was an end of a seven-year cycle. So there should be another event seven years before that began it in the financial realm. The first crash took place on September 17, 2001, the greatest stock market crash in history up to that time. And it would keep that record for seven years. So right there, you have the Shemitah. You have a seven-year period beginning with the greatest crash and ending with the greatest crash on September 29, 2008. There is a little bit of a consternation down here about there being no bell. Our market reporters are, are standing by. Bob Pisani, have you ever seen anything like no bell? Yeah, uh, that's a little strange here. Because the opening bell of Wall Street wouldn't sound. People took it as a bad omen. But what date was September 17th on the Hebrew calendar? And the answer is stunning. September 17, 2001 was also the 29th day of Elul, the day when a nation's financial accounts are wiped away. So the two greatest stock market point crashes in the history of Wall Street up to that date happened on the exact, both of them, on the exact biblical day ordained to touch a nation's financial realm. Exactly seven Hebrew years apart. It's mind boggling. But even beyond that, Elul 29 comes around once every year, and that would be enough. But it's even more than that. Only one Elul 29 can start or end the Shemitah. And that comes around only once every seven years. So when did the crash of 2008 happen? It wasn't only on Elul 29. It was on the specific exact Elul 29 that comes around only once every seven years that can, that can end the Shemitah or fulfill the Shemitah. In fact, when it was happening, when, the, when the, the markets of the world were crashing, at the same time in Israel, Orthodox Jews were symbolically erasing their debts. And that means that the other Shemitah, 2001, also took place on the one and only Elul 29 that can end the Shemitah. Who could have put this all together? Who could have put all these financial transactions and all these government decisions, a million things, to make this happen? Not any human hand. And in fact, there's one more mystery of the Shemitah, that the Shemitah means literally in Hebrew, it can mean the release, but it can also mean the letting fall or the collapse, the letting collapse. So what was the Shemitah? Not only the collapse of the economy, according to an ancient mystery, but it's the letting collapse of the American-led world order. It's letting collapse America's prosperity that had been there, the leadership that had been there from the end of the Second World War. It's all collapsing. This is the Shemitah. The Shemitah, the sign of judgment on a nation's economy and finance for a nation that once knew God, but drove him out, a warning that its blessings 
will be removed if it does not turn back to God. There's a law in the Bible that for a truth to be established or a judgment to be pronounced, there has to be two or three witnesses testifying on it. Now what happens if we bring this to a national level? The most dramatic witness of America under judgment is the proclaiming of the ancient vow of judgment that links America to ancient Israel that links America to being a nation in defiance, that a nation that is being shaken and being called back to God. And so could there be two or three witnesses? Well, we have seen the beginning of this in the Harbingers. The first witness comes on September 12, 2001. And this is the Senate Majority Leader on Capitol Hill the day after 9-11 when he says this at the, at the peak of his speech, he says, I know there's only the smallest measure inspiration of inspiration that can, that can be, be taken from this devastation. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled but we will replace them with cedars. Second witness, could there be another one? There is. Three years later, virtually to the day, the second witness also gives testimony in Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, September 11, 2004. Speaking of the same event linked to 9-11, the vice presidential candidate on the Democratic ticket in the same city proclaims this, he says, Today, Today, on, this day, of on this day of remembrance and mourning, we have the Lord's word to get us through. The bricks have fallen, but we will build with dressed stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will put cedars in their place. And then he bases his entire speech around the ancient, ominous vow of Israel's destruction. Each of them, without realizing what they're doing, pronouncing judgment on America and identifying it as the nation in defiance of God under his judgments. That's two witnesses. But the Bible says two or three witnesses. Now, a third witness on an even higher level and that who will link it all together even to the economic shaking, the shaking of America from 9-11 to now. The answer is there is a third witness and the third witness is the President of the United States. It's evening, February 24th, 2009. The new President goes to Capitol Hill for the first time, one month after being inaugurated on a campaign of hope. He enters the House of Representatives. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. goes to the podium, the nation's economy is still in free fall. Thank you, thank you everybody, thank you. The chamber quiets and he begins and he, after setting the stage of the magnitude of the economic crisis and collapse, he says this, he turns his speech and he says this, but while our economy may be weakened and our confidence, and our confidence shaken, shaken. Though we are living through difficult and uncertain times, tonight I want every American to know this. We will rebuild. We will rebuild. It's one thing to say this at the site of destruction, but to say this at an economic crisis is a, is a strange and unnatural voicing. The vow is now being linked not only to the first calamity, but to the second, the economic collapse. Traders here working the phone say a lot of their customers are freaked out, waiting to see how low the Dow will go. They're focused on the Dow. And one of the dynamics of the harbingers or the warnings is that they always surface. They always become especially visible. They're put on display. And so with this, it's amazing because throughout the world, the news services of the world, the internet, on, on television, on radio, in the press, they all are drawn to one particular statement 
of the president's words, of his speech, of all the words he said, they focus on one. Headlines, CBS News, headlines. Obama, we will rebuild. CNN, Obama, we will rebuild. MSNBC, Obama tonight, we will rebuild. Times Online, Obama tells America, we will rebuild. Fox News, Obama says country will rebuild. Al Jazeera, Obama pledges U.S. will rebuild. Associated Press, Obama, we will rebuild. New York Times, Obama vows, we will rebuild. Isaiah 910, we will rebuild. The words go all over the world. And the president adds a second line. He says, we will rebuild. We will rebuild. We will recover. We will recover. Now on the day after 9-11, the Senate Majority Leader, when he made his vow, he said specifically at the end of it, he said, that is what we will do. We will rebuild and we will recover. We will rebuild and we will recover the f exact same words. The president proclaims the same words as the first witness. Listen to a commentary on Isaiah 9:10. It says this, the arrogant response demonstrates how stubborn and overconfident the people of Israel were. They thought they could determine their own destiny. The words of the president that night, he says this. The weight of this crisis will not determine the destiny of this nation. In other words, the bricks have fallen, but it's not going to matter. We will rebuild. And what would be the answer to America's problems? Just as with ancient Israel, it would be its own resources. The president says this. The answers to our problems don't lie beyond our reach. They exist in our laboratories, in our universities in our fields and our factories, in the imaginations of our entrepreneurs, in the pride of the hardest working people on earth. In the pride of the hardest working people on earth. In other words, with bricks and with cedars, we will rebuild. And then he adds this, he says this. And the United States of America will emerge stronger than before. The key of Isaiah 910 is that, if you took the whole thing and summed it up, it's that we will emerge stronger than before. Now, if you take the words of a commentary on Isaiah 910 and you superimpose it, that which is on ancient Israel, and you superimpose it on the president's words, this is what happens. Listen to what you get from the commentary. They boasted that they would rebuild their devastated country. The president, we will rebuild, we will recover. Commentary, and make it stronger and more glorious than ever before. President, and the United States of America will emerge stronger than before. The third witness, three witnesses testify the truth confirmed, the judgment confirmed. There is a mystery that's been hidden in the foundation of America from its very beginning, from its very first day as a nation. And it's a biblical mystery that has to do with dedication, consecration and judgment. 3,000 years ago, Israel dedicated its temple and its future to God. And it happened on the Temple Mount. King Solomon gathered the nation together, the leaders together. And it was a day of prayer, a day of consecration. The, the king spoke of God's hand on the nation, his providence on the nation. And he looked to the future. He looked to the days when the nation would turn away from God and deal with judgment. And he prayed for mercy for the nation for that time. The nation of Israel did turn away from God and judgment would come. And the final ultimate sign of judgment was when the calamity, the destruction, touched that Temple Mount, that same place where the nation had been consecrated the nation's consecration ground, its ground of prayer, and, and its ground of dedication. And so this was the sign of judgment. So here's a principle. In the days of judgment, the calamity or the destruction touches the nation's ground of consecration. The nation's ground of dedication to God becomes its ground of judgment. And so this is a mystery of return, of returning back. God was calling Israel back to him and saying, remember the place from which you have fallen. Calling you back to prayer and to seek my face that I might have mercy on you.
Now America is similar to Israel, was also founded on God's word. In fact, America was founded originally by the Puritans to be a second Israel. Was there a day that corresponds to this day of dedication in America's history? There was, America's inaugural day. It wasn't 1776, it was 1789, April 30th, was the first day that America existed as we know it today, as a fully constituted nation with a president presiding over a government. April 30th, 1789 was the inauguration of America's first president, George Washington. And that day was also a day of dedication, a day that the nation and its leaders gathered together in the nation's capital city, a day of prayer. Uh, as Solomon spoke of God's providence, so Washington spoke of God's providence. And as Solomon spoke of the future generations that would turn away from God, so Washington gave a prophetic warning. In that day, that first day of America as a nation, there is hidden or there is embedded a prophetic message, a warning in the first address of America's first president on the first day. And he said in effect, he said this in effect, he spoke, he spoke of the smiles of heaven, but what he said in effect is, if America ever turns away from God and from his ways, God would remove his blessings from the land. And that is coming true in our day. One of the blessings that Washington would speak about or pray about was the blessing of his, he called it his holy protection. He keeps America in holy protection. We are witnessing these blessings being removed. But that wasn't all. That day, as the day of dedication is a day of prayer, the first act of the American government together was not to pass a law or debate, it was to pray, to gather in prayer, and to consecrate the nation's future to God. So after that presidential address, Washington leads America's first government, its first House of Representatives, its first Senate, its first cabinet, on a procession on foot to the ground that will become America's consecration ground, the place where they will pray. Where is it? Because this is key. Where was America dedicated to God on its first day as a nation? America's first capital wasn't Washington, D.C., it wasn't Philadelphia, it was New York City. Specifically, it was Lower Manhattan. And specifically, they did this, the ground of consecration was a little stone chapel called St. Paul's Chapel, still stands today. Where is it located? It stands at ground zero. America was dedicated to God on the corner of Ground Zero. In fact, it goes even farther than that. Ground Zero was actually owned by the church. It was church land. So America's consecration ground is Ground Zero. When judgment comes, it returns to the nation's ground of consecration. And so Ground Zero is America's mystery ground. America dedicated on its first day to God, right there at the corner of Ground Zero, the nation's entire government there praying before God for the future, for now, at Ground Zero. And there was a tree that grew on that ground, on America's ground of consecration, and that tree was the sycamore. The sycamore, the harbinger, the sycamore that was struck down grew on the nation's consecration ground, the ground of judgment. And the Erez tree, the, the, re, the tree that replaced the sycamore, it all happened at St. Paul's, the nation's ground of consecration. And that's the same day that links the nation back to the warning that the first president ever gave America, that if it departed from God's ways, its blessings would be removed. And on that day, 
when 9-11 came, when, when Ground Zero was struck, a shock wave went forth from Ground Zero and it struck Federal Hall, the place where Washington gave the warning that the nation's blessings would be removed. And it struck the foundation of Federal Hall and it cracked it. And of all the buildings that surrounded Ground Zero, only one survived with virtually no damage. What building? It was the chapel, the little stone chapel where America was dedicated to God, where its future was committed to God. Why was it protected? They say it was because of a sycamore that was struck down that actually shielded the chapel, which says something. The harbingers are not ultimately to bring judgment. They're a sign of judgment, but their purpose is to bring salvation, to bring redemption, to bring turning, to bring revival. So all this speaks of something. This is the mystery of return. God is calling a nation back as he did Israel. He's calling America back to return. He says, his voice cries out from ground zero to say, return, do not be destroyed, do not perish, return and be saved. God's will is not judgment for America. God's will is redemption. And there is a scripture in the Bible that is for now that God gave to Solomon when Solomon prayed about the future of Israel when that nation would turn away from him and be in danger of destruction. And this is the scripture that is now the call for America. And it's from 2 Chronicles 7. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That is the word for America. God is calling America to return from what it has fallen from, to return to its foundation, to return to prayer, to return to seeking him and to return in repentance. It says, turn from their evil ways. After 9-11, people flocked to the houses of worship uh, all across the land. It looked like there was almost going to be a revival, but there wasn't. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, it seems, Lord, that when we are most vulnerable, you touch human hearts with a blessing of your spirit. We ask Almighty God to watch over our nation and grant us patience and resolve in all that is to come. And may he always guide our country. God bless America. There was no repentance. There was, there was calls of God bless America, but there was no searching of hearts, no searching of ways, no seeking, are we doing something wrong? Are we out of God's will? What does God say? And will, are we willing to turn back? So without repentance, there is no salvation. So if there's gonna be a change of destiny, there has to be a change of course, and that is with repentance. God is calling a true change to turn away from that which is clearly against his ways, clearly against his word, and back to his way. So that is the call for America. He is calling America just as he called Nineveh, as he called other nations to be saved in the days of judgment. And then beyond that is the call to his people, both true believers. It says, if my people, and the key is the word if. So it's not just for the nation, it is for those who are called by his name. God is calling us as believers to repent from our sins, from our compromises with the world, from our apathy, from our not sharing the gospel, for our not reaching out to the lost, 
for our compromises with sin, with secret sins. With our pursuit of materialism and prosperity instead of seeking the will of God. God is calling us to rise for such a time as this. We need to be bold and manifest the love in truth. We are the lights to America, and this is the time we must shine.